Hello, Laurent. Uh, I want to ask you something about uh, titrating extrinsic PEEP with a patient, the patient on controlled ventilation with intrinsic PEEP. And I agree with you that most of the studies actually show that your end transpiratory volume increases after giving extrinsic PEEP. But there was a paper by Amato about 10 years ago in critical care medicine who showed in a few patients that plateau pressure actually paradoxically decreased after giving extrinsic PEEP. Can you comment on that? Do you think yeah. So, yeah, thank you. So yeah, sure, and I discussed that with Marcelo. So um, so in general, I don't, I don't think you, you, you should expect, because people have in mind that you put external PEEP, oh yeah, so the, the lung will, will empty. And in most of the cases, it does not happen. So he showed that in some patients using relatively high PEEP, uh, relatively surprisingly, uh, at the end, the, the lung volume decreased. We don't know the mechanism. Maybe there were some plugs which uh, reopened some part of the lung, which uh, uh, facilitate uh, emptying. Uh, and you agree that it's only a minority of patients. So I would say most of the patients, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the benefit of external PIP does not exist. You do not decrease dynamic hyperinflation. Uh, but in some patients it may happen, and I'm not sure whether it's by increasing external PEEP or by increasing plateau pressure, because they increase everything. So, so that may be simply like bagging a patient and, and you may reopen some part of the lung, but that's just a hypothesis. Yeah, Laurent, I have a question about the volume at end inspiration. I think in the older papers by Tuxon, he showed that complications related to hyperinflation were few or non-existent if the volume at end inspiration was below 20 ml per kilogram. So do you think that we should measure this volume in patients with COPD on controlled ventilation instead of measuring intrinsic PEEP with end expiratory holes? Uh, I, I don't know. Is, is that okay? <laughs> um, you, would you do that in your? No, but but he, so he, he showed that yeah the issue and and again it's uh, it's often it's the same discussion than before uh, a major source of confusion in the discussion about PEEP because we have studies where we increase PEEP and we don't pay attention because the study is focusing on PEEP at what happens at an inspiration. And yes, I'm convinced that this is the, the, probably the more problematic uh, in terms of risk of barotrauma, VLE, or hemodynamic complication. What matters in terms of, for instance, uh, cardiac function, right, right ventricular function, is really the plateau pressure. So yes, it may be different to increase PEEP, but keep the same uh, plateau pressure. And so what you suggested could make sense, but I have no other data. Can I ask both of you a question? Lise, you, you talked about, and we heard this morning, about the relationship between asynchrony and poor outcomes. And the, the, the comment that appropriately so, we don't know it's cause and effect. So isn't it about time we did a trial where we took patients who are at high risk for asynchrony and randomized them to a method to increase synchrony and to see, see what their outcomes are? And is that on its way? And sh or if it's not, should it be? Probably yes, but what is complicated is defining who is at risk of having a high number of asynchronies. And the second problem is to really detect patient ventilator asynchrony is the clinical practice at the bedside. It is now possible with the ADI, but before it was really very complicated because only experts really can uh, find an asynchrony on a standard uh, a standard uh, ventilator screen. But I think that now with EADI, we can do such a study. And of course, it's important. Laurent, can you comment and also maybe comment on uh, the program, the software that Louis Blanc has developed to do this, to automate, to automate the detection of asynchronies and how good is it and could that be used in a trial? So, the, so I, 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 I think we are very close to start this kind of study. So, um, the, the first thing is that uh, these asynchrony are related both to patients' mechanics and, uh, and ventilatory needs and to settings. For instance, in this study we did with Arnaud Till, trying different techniques, there were 
still something like 30% of patients in whom we could not suppress this asynchrony. So for sure, in this patient, this was probably a marker of their bad underlying condition. So if we think of a trial, we, we should have in mind that uh, it will not benefit 100% of the patient. In some of them, it, it's only a marker. Laurent, in those 30%, did you try NAVA or PAV? No, no. So that, that might be the best way to, to, to test this out, huh? Well, I, I, I would say because, so that was a study where we selected patients based on obvious asynchrony on the ventilator, and that's where uh, Louis Blanc software detecting online asynchrony with, with relatively uh, robust uh, um, uh, algorithm, which, which you can even define, you can even modify. So based on the, the flow tracing, which I showed, uh, so that would be very helpful to detect patients and I would think that those who still have asynchrony I'm not sure they will benefit the most but those who have purely asynchrony uh, because of um, bad setting on, on the ventilator I would think they, they, they should benefit but maybe we should stratify between the two groups because one of the reasons they may have longer term of ventilation is simply that uh, the, we, we don't assess these patients as, as being able to be separated from the ventilator, for instance. And we can also probably induce uh, some respiratory muscle dysfunction. I, I was just studying those, but you're right to, to stratify. Dimitri. Uh, thanks for, for, for the talks. Uh, regarding the first question, uh, one year before Amato, we published a study in intensive care medicine describing the same phenomenon and uh, actually we study the mechanism. Okay. And uh, we found that using small amounts of PIP, around two or three, actually you decrease a lot resistance. We measure expiratory resistance using a very, very, very complicated method. So we found that at the end of expiration, resistance may decrease by only two or three centimeters of water a lot. Mm -hmm. by two or three times. Well, one final question, uh, Lisa. Uh, in theory, you wouldn't need extrinsic PEEP when you use NAVA in a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease for triggering the machine. So what do you do in practice? You mean you're in NAVA? Yeah. yeah. In practice, I put the PEEP as I would put the PEEP during pressure support ventilation, but not for the triggering, because uh, during NAVA, the triggering is not related to intrinsic PEEP. But the best way I've found is just doing what we are used to do for the moment. <laughs>